So good, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Make UK webinar um, in association with Holft. Uh, my name's Tim Figures, and I'm the Director of Technology, Sustainability and Innovation at uh, Make UK. And I'm joined by Jim Davison and Stephen Tulip from our regional membership team in the south, Professor Jan Vita Lanzola from the Cass Business School at City University London, and Irfan Karahok from our sponsors, Holft. And for the next uh, 90 minutes or so, we'll be talking to you about digital transformation, something that is uh, a high priority for us uh, at Make UK and uh, something uh, which we think is particularly relevant and hopefully interesting to, to all of you. So I'm gonna hand over to Jim now for some introductions. Jim, over to you. Thank you, Tim. Good morning, uh, everybody. Absolute pleasure to have you today on our, our webinar. Um, we're gonna be talking future technologies uh, and very privileged to be partnering with Hulft and Vito this, after, this morning even. A um, couple of housekeeping points. One is we've got all of our in um, meeting mode. Um, if you would like to ask a question and I encourage you to do so, please use the QA box. Um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, um, you'll see a, a, a bubble that says Q and A. Uh, if you put your, your questions in there, we'll facilitate a question to answer the session and make sure those are answered. Um, that was all I was going to say, but very pleased to welcome you this morning. And now I'm going to hand back to Tim. Tim, over Thank to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. And we should also just say that we are recording this session um, so that uh, we can share it on YouTube later for the benefit of people who weren't able to join us this morning. So just to let you know that um, this session will be made public uh, after the event. So thank you very much. And what I uh, just wanted to do now was, uh, let me just share my screen with you, and then we should... There we go. Hopefully everyone can see that. So um, I wanted to talk to you just briefly um, about Make UK's Make It Smart campaign, which this event is part of and which uh, explains why we're focusing so much on uh, technology and, uh, and innovation um, at the moment. Uh, that's the agenda that we will go through today. So there will be the opportunity after Jam Vito has spoken for you to ask questions you can, as Jim has says, put your questions in the Q&A box at any point during the session, um, and then we will get to it later. So you don't have to wait until the discussion uh, before uh, asking a question. If something occurs to you as we're going along, please type it in the Q&A box. And also, if you see a question somebody else has asked that you like the uh, look of, you can vote and give it a Facebook style thumbs up and then um, it will move to the top of the list and we will answer that question as a priority. Now, one of the four key campaigns uh, we are uh, doing at Make UK uh, this year is called hashtag make it smart. And this is all about um, industrial digitalization what some people call the fourth industrial revolution, other people call industry 4.0. But ultimately what it's about is how we um, digitalize our manufacturing base to improve productivity, the quality of products, and also importantly, resilience. I think something that the COVID pandemic has shown us is quite how fragile some of our supply chains are. And as I'll explain in a minute, technology has got a really important role in helping us um, uh, overcome those issues uh, and improve the way that, that we work. And we're doing three key things. Um, first of all, what we've done is a lot of investigation a bit earlier in the year into the support networks and services that are provided to manufacturing SMEs in order to help with industrial digitalization. Now, in some parts of the country, particularly in the Northwest of England, uh, these are quite developed and sophisticated. Elsewhere, there are a number of uh, different uh, people trying their best, but things are perhaps less well uh, developed. So we produced this policy paper that you can see here, and I'll circulate a bit later a link so you can download it, uh, which we published in May with 15 recommendations aimed at industry, government and uh, regional stakeholders as to how our sector can be better supported uh, on its digitalization journey. 
Secondly, we're holding a number of best practice events of this is one, uh, which this is one to try and um, uh, inspire and inform um, our members and broader stakeholders. And we're also in the process of updating our evidence base just to see exactly how um, uh, our industry is doing at the moment. We've just uh, closed uh, a major innovation monitor survey. We're crunching the numbers as we speak, uh, but from the first cut, it looks as though we are making significant progress since uh, 2018, which was the last time uh, we looked at this, but some very significant and quite stubborn and predictable barriers um, still remain. And I'm sure we will get into talking about those a little bit later on. And just before uh, I pass over to uh, Gianvito, I just wanted to uh, give a little bit of a reflection about what we've learned in working with our members during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, in particular, the contribution that uh, industrial digital technologies have made to improving resilience. So that could, for example, be things like the way additive manufacturing, 3D printing, was used to uh, print critical components for ventilators when traditional supply chains uh, were disrupted. It could be the way people who'd moved their back offices and their systems to the cloud were able to keep on working and keep their sales and marketing and regulatory departments and HR departments functioning even though they couldn't go into their uh, factories. And also increasingly, as we now move to come back to work in a COVID-19 secure way, technology also helps that way, as robots, for example, don't need to socially distance. We're seeing quite a lot of our members looking at uh, technologies such as robotics um, to help them um, get back to full production in a way that protects the health and safety uh, of their staff and their, and their workers. So I hope that is a useful backdrop about what we're doing at Make UK, what we think we've learned over the last three or four months and how this event, which I'm really, really grateful to Alft for supporting, fits into our overall programme. So I'm going to stop uh, my presentation there and it gives me great pleasure to pass over to Professor Gianvito Alanzola from um, City University Cass Business School. Gianvito, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. It's my pleasure being here today. So I will be discussing, um, as asked by uh, Halft and Make UK, my views on digital transformation and more specifically resilience in the digital age. So just give me one second to share my screen. And I'll be right back. Okay, so as um, uh, kindly uh, said by uh, the host of this session, I'm Gianvito Lanzale, professor at Casmis School, City University of London. You find my, my content details here. The goal of today is, um, I'm gonna be, go very quickly into the, the agenda. Um, I'm gonna try give you my view of what is digital transformation and why we should care. I mean, I know that you all, we are all aware, but I'm gonna uh, also add my two cents. And then uh, what, should, what are my views on what should manufacturers do to build resilience in the digital age? And then, I mean, we will, uh, I hope that through this uh, brief presentation, I mean, this is much, there is a, a summary of a lot of work going on in the background. You may be able to understand whether you are ready and what roadmap you may want to put in place to move to the next stage into digital transformation and resilience in the digital age. Now, when we speak about the digital transformation, digital, uh, the, the fourth industrial revolution or uh, industry 4.0, whatever, however you want to call it, often we equate it, with, there, there is a very, very simple equation that many people make in their minds. Digital technology diffusion equal data and the digital engines for companies. Now that's true. And then, I mean, we have all seen that through digital technology diffusion, we have the physical world becoming more and more digital, 
to the processes of convergence, smartification, and to the, the processes of virtualization. That's absolutely important, and digitalization and connectivity are the technologies that enable this transformation. I mean, you clearly can understand already here that there is a lot when you smartify a pair of shoes or when you want to, to virtualize the training in your uh, oil and gas operations or wherever, uh, wherever you, you are, there is a significant change vis-a-vis -vis the old world where everything was physical. And we have already seen that the, 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 the bedrock of the fourth industrial revolution is the blending of the digital and the physical. And, to put things into context, I mean, to make it even more, uh, let's say, concrete and uh, we can touch it. So blending of physical and digital means that by 2030, 80%, I mean, these are all estimates, so nobody has a crystal ball, but anyway, just to have a, a rough uh, understanding of where we are heading, 80% of the world population will be fully connected. So you can basically understand what it means that instantaneously you can, con you can connect with everyone just a few, few years down the line. Plus, 50 billion connected devices. 50 billion connected devices. It means that if the world population will reach eight and a half billion, there will be some, something like um, seven, eight connected devices per person on, on our earth, or trillions of sensors. I mean, this is something that is already now sounds quite big. Now, digitalization and connectivity drive the blending of physical and digital, and that's the, the bedrock. Any manufacturer that wishes to move into it and lead in Industry 4.0 in or the fourth industrial revolution, connectivity, digitalization, blending, blending physical and digital is the point number one, which of course there's a lot of technology that has to be put over there. And uh, just to give some, uh, some let's say, uh, figurative image, images, uh, people will become just physical and a series of numbers, a series of zero and one, or our trains, there will, will be trains and there will be the, what some people call digital twin, which is a way it's a, it's a collection of technologies to uh, recreate virtually the operations that go on the rail track. Now, that's just the beginning, because once you connect and digitize everything, this creates an incredible quantity of data. Now, 35 zettabytes of data, I quite frankly don't know exactly what it means. It just means so many zeros that I, uh, at least I cannot conceive. So there, there will be an incredible amount of data that will be created by digitization and connectivity. Now, you are, I'm sure, very familiar with images like this. Clearly, some companies are better positioned than other ones in making the most of data, okay? And uh, I don't think I have to mention uh, any examples. They are fairly self-evident. Now, if digitalization and connectivity creates a zettabyte of data. So this ocean of data, this is often called the new oil, but you know very well that oil without an engine doesn't go, doesn't get any traction. So to, if we want to keep the metaphor forward, if we want to push this metaphor forward, if data is the new oil, what is going to be the new engines? So, you, you can, in the, in the old economy, there were pl uh, places that were successful, such as, uh, the, let's say, the Saudi Arabia, or, um, because they, they had oil, other that uh, they became very successful, such as the UK or the US, because they, they could create the engines that uh, exploited the oil. Now, what, what is going to be the new engines in the digital, uh, in the digital era? We have all heard about cloud, artificial intelligence, blockchain, and that's just the beginning. We are all familiar with the cloud, blockchain, artificial intelligence, but going forward, the roadmap is already uh, pretty, uh, pretty clear. Quantum computing, or just 
they, we, are, we are already ready for this, 5G. So there's a lot of technology that will act as an engine on this data that will be created by digitalization and connectivity. Now, if you, if you have followed me so far, from so digital technology diffusion creates this, if you want this equation. So connectivity, digitization, data, artificial intelligence, cloud, distributed ledgers, which someone calls uh, block, I mean, blockchain is a specific distributed ledger and many more technologies to come. Some people think that this is uh, the equation that drives uh, digital transformation. Now, this is incredibly important, but this is uh, just one part of the equation. Because, I mean, digital technology diffusion not only changes the bedrocks of our companies, digital technologies change significantly also the external environment. And this is, I mean, the first, let's say, point that I wanted to share with you. Thinking that digital technology is about, digital transformation is about technology might be slightly misleading, it might be even perhaps erroneous. Because, I mean, just to, to throw you one of the zillions examples that I can share with you, if you think that te technology is the only thing, the only game in town, now you may end up doing something like this. I mean, BNP Paribas in London, in a London offices, throwing something, three billions on technology, and then, uh, and then say, okay, that's it. We put the technology, things will happen. Then the leadership team switch off. And what does it happen? What it happens is that technology in search of problems. So this is, I mean, one clear takeaway, one clear emergent regularity. There is a massive bedrock of technology that companies have to grapple with to enter into the digital, digital age, but technology per se doesn't bring you there. If you just think that it's about technology, you will end up having technology in search of problems, which very, very soon will create uh, even, uh, even some resistance, or big resistance in terms of moving to the next stage in digital transformation and leading in the digital age. What, the point that I want to make here is that you need really not only to think about technology, but what is changing in your external environment because of digital technology diffusion. Your clients, okay? And by the way, I'm just focusing here on some direct impacts of digital technologies, okay? Just direct ones. So if you think about your clients, your clients will all have to grapple with this big trade-off between privacy and customization. Digital technologies, on the one end, promise customization. On the other end, they, have, and they might intrude into your privacy. This can be, I know that on the other side of the screen, there are both B2C and B2B companies. It doesn't matter. I mean, privacy in, in, uh, in a B2B context, it's called trade secrets, or it's, it's called your own IP, intellectual property. And see, in this trade-off, in this big trade-off, a company like GE, which we cannot really claim was a, is a small company, came out with this system called Predix. And Predix, it has been a, this, uh, sorry, I'm going to be a little bit blunt here, and it, it has not gone as well as they thought. Okay, I have made it slightly more, uh, uh, slightly softer not because they didn't invest in technology, but because they didn't fully uh, understand that without building trust with the stakeholders that had to, sh to share data, predicts cannot work. So this is a significant investment that Jeff Immelt made before, uh, let's say, leaving the, uh, to the next CEO. And it has gone nowhere really nowhere, and they're even thinking about a spinning, uh, spinning off this division from G, because, they, because of privacy issues, because in the case of B2B, companies didn't want to share with G their own IP, their own data. So this is not just I mean, something philosophical, it's very concrete, billions gone to the drain. 
what are the other, the other trade-offs in clients, for your clients? Choices versus curation. Digital technologies create a lot, the potential for choice. But I mean, who, is, who has been more successful? Yahoo, whereby you get lost, spoiled for choices or lost for choices, or Google, which gives you one curated choice. Just type your question, I will give you some answers. So this is a significant change, a paradox even, created by digital technology. Choices, spoil for choices. The most successful is the, a company that gives you only one choice, just only one search box. Um, just try to systematize these trade-offs for you to, uh, for, for you to, I mean, to, to perhaps even challenge some of your assumptions that there is no linear change created by digital technology. It's actually very ambiguous and non-linear. And that's uh, uh, just the first two. What about the changes created by cloud computing, access versus ownership? Many companies get <laughs> paralyzed. Why should I lose control of what I have always build, built inside the company? It has always been in my balance sheet. Now, and I wanted to make it as an OPEX. It becomes something that I buy. So you, you really need to go deep in understanding your clients' challenges first. And second, specifically, how would they would position themselves in the spectrum shaped by these trade-offs? But this is just one, the first question. So do you still know your clients in the digital age? And by the way, I'm focusing only on changes directly created and triggered by digital technologies, because there are other trends, but this is just for digital technologies. Now, what about competition? Many of us still think that we are competing against our usual suspects. This is another very, let's say, uh, revealing metaphor. Are we still competing with our next door client or with, against Google? I will also share in the end a very quick case study that to make it even more relevant. So where does competition come from? That's something that we are used that we know very well from cognitive psychology that we tend to think what it has always been familiar to us. So we compete against that company, that German company, that, that American company. What about if competition comes from a completely different side, whereby, for example, Google or Apple enter into our, our or Amazon, even more, enter into our space? So do we, need, do we still know whom we are competing against? Geopolitics, I mean, this is something very, very relevant, very contemporary. I mean, all our manufacturing companies m might be significantly squeezed or even trapped into the, this geopolitical war, which is basically now based on technology. You know, who is going to be the owner of the platforms or the technological platforms that uh, allow the, the world or the world, the part of the world that this, uh, um, the US and China wants to control to communicate, to digitize, to digitally transform. That's a significant uh, uh, it's a significant transformation that we need to grapple with. Think about your, not only your markets, also your, your supply chain. If you get trapped into some retaliation between US and China, and, and you, you, you all know exactly what I'm referring to, supply chain can be disrupted. Markets can just be foreclosed without us even having, not because our business was not going, doing well, but because we get trapped into a geopolitical war just for controlling, just for controlling technology uh, on earth. And if you want perhaps the most subtle challenge that we have is the one about regulation. I mean, we are, I mean, regulation in the, at the moment, it's really an empty book. Pages are blank. But, and there is, a, my research shows that there is a significant, even at the board level, actually perhaps even more at the board level, 
there is a significant misunderstanding. Many companies are, if you want, confusing compliance with legitimacy. So since there is still a relatively large regulatory vacuum, many companies think that whatever the activities that are compliant, okay, that tick the box of compliance are okay. Now, the reality is that in this period of significant change, as I have discussed with you a few minutes ago, we can be compliant, so we can tick the boxes, but we may use, lose legitimacy if we do something that even if it's compliant, even if it's business efficient, doesn't factor in changes in regulation or changes in client and consumer preferences. And this is, I know, this is not an exercise of crystal balling. This is a, an exercise of judgment that leadership teams and the boards have to constantly go through because otherwise we can be compliant and not legitimate. If we lose legitimacy, it doesn't matter that we were compliant. We lose the business. Now, a company that is really, really, really trying hard to lose legitimacy, in my view, is Facebook. They are really, I mean, Zuckerberg is significantly trying to, to lose legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis -vis clients and regulator. If I had time, I would show you some videos or many other examples. <laughs> they call it the apology tour. tour. Uh, Zuckerberg has already been asked to speak in front of, of senior commissions of the US, US Congress, senior commission. A commission because committees because of misbehaviors of his company. Now, even if Facebook so far is compliant, but is building so much, in my view, is I mean, is little by little losing legitimacy. So, what does it happen when you lose legitimacy? And it, Facebook is only one. I mean, this is quickly the data from the, from the Economist. Have a look how many how many matters, tax and legal matters Facebook has with, okay, this is EU based, uh, with uh, around more than 12, 13 matters open as 2019. That's uh, quite a significant number. Sooner or later, the regulator can say, okay, enough, enough, and then you lose legitimacy and then you use your business. So are you leaving the compliance drive your business instead of exerting your judgment of what will be legitimate going forward. So the first point that I wanted to make today is that uh, this, is, this industry 4.0, fourth industrial revolution, however you want to call it, it's technology enabled, but actually is very much multi-level change. It goes way beyond the data and artificial intelligence what which I called the digital engines, triggers significant changes in the external environment, in clients, in competition, in regulation, in even in geopolitics, in geopolitical framework, which requires a significant rethinking of your strategy. Now, think this is just one specific part, then that is a bang, a massive bang, a massive bang that make UK is trying to to, uh, let's say, to embed even more in the manufacturing platform of the UK. But there are even more. There is, a, uh, and by the way, this is this bank, as we said, is so big that some people uh, call it the fourth industrial revolution, especially in the UK, it's mostly called fourth industrial revolution. In other parts, it's called industry 4.0. So what, why the fourth industrial revolution? The first one was steam. I mean, it's self-explanatory, then electricity, then electro electronics, and now digital. So um, the ambition is that uh, as the first industrial revolution was born in the UK, even the fourth one will find a very fertile ground in the UK. So that's our ambition um, going forward. Now, this is just, I mean, just one part, eh? because then you need to add the other trends. Now, we have a little bit in this period of COVID-19, we have a... Uh, a, a parked uh, quite a bit, the other big emergency, now, I, don't want, I don't want to make a political point, 
I mean, climate change, there is evidence that is going to be the big thing going forward. Now, <laughs> some people charge it politically, but from a business professor perspective, climate change seems to, building on the evidence that we collect is another big change that has to be considered for our resilience. So it's not only the left hand side of the screen, not only the digital engine, the data and the changes in the macro environment, is the, the new normal after COVID-19, is the climate change. It's a bang with a bang, it's a double bang. Now, when there is double bang, some people, and me included many times, I mean, we may like I mean, to stick our head into the sand because it's, it's tough, it's painful. I mean, here superheroes are in, in cartoons for, for kids, not for in, in the reality. But the assumption that we have been making over time on value creation and value camp capturing, are they resilient to this double bang? This is the big question that I believe leadership teams and the leadership teams I work with constantly ask and constantly probe. And boards, boards and leadership team, it has to be a, a constant, a constant uh, let's say, discussion between this senior level in the organization. Because some of the value creation assumption and value capturing assumption that we have made may not be strong enough, may not be resilient to this double bang. Now, I'm going to show you very quickly this slide, uh, not because I want to make an history, a, a presentation about history, but because I want to make a point very shortly. So on the horizontal axis here, you see time, okay? From the beginning of known human history, let's say 8,000 uh, before Christ, to our days. And on the vertical axis, you can see an index, a human social development index, okay? both on the left and on the right, millions of people. Now, if you look at the Human Social Development Index, for the vast majority of time, for thousands of years, it was a very flat, smooth line. Very flat, very smooth. Today, you could picture what might have happened by building on yesterday. But see what happens around this dotted line, just uh, uh, what here is uh, identified by what steam engine introduced in 1775. The very smooth linear development takes a massive abrupt change. It becomes, there is an, what we call an inflection point. Now, when there is an inflection point, See, if you want to predict today or tomorrow based on yesterday, you are completely off because yesterday you were going at this very smooth pace. Now it becomes almost vertical. Why I'm showing this? And I can show you other zillions of graphs. So this is about the labor force occupation, uh, occupational class in the, UK, uh, in the UK. I think these are data about the UK. So for many years, uh, in percentage, people were, uh, LWS is a service class for many centuries, for many years, and even centuries, it was were basically an irrelevant part of, the, of, the, of, the, of the, our communities. And then there is an inflection point and LWS becomes the most relevant part in, in many economies. So think about manufacturing that looked like it was, and this is very relevant for us. Remember, these are data in relative terms. Eh? So manufacturing looked like it was the only game in town until the, uh, let's say this year, I don't want to, uh, let me, I'm sorry. I went to, this is around uh, um, 1980s, something like that, whereby manufacturing started first to plateau and even a little bit declining. Now, th these are actually data for the, uh, the uh, overall uh, world. These are data for the UK, uh, it's exactly the same. You can see that um, um, you can see the th three different colors, and then uh, service becoming more and more prevailing. Manufacturing after peaking in 19, let's say around 70s, becoming a smaller part. What I want to make here, I don't want to speak about history. What I want to discuss here is that when there are banks, when there are even double banks, there are inflection points. So making 
And when there are inflection points, making predictions is incredibly difficult. There is a very famous interview that the BBC did with uh, David Bowie in 1999 about the future of internet. When you, uh, you will get the slides, you can click on this slide and there is the link of this interview. And you will see the BBC presenter uh, being very skeptical about uh, asking David Bowie, but I mean, what is this internet, 1999? What is internet? It's nothing, just another distribution channel. It's another channel to distribute uh, uh, content. And David Bowie is calling it, no, that is going to be an alien form. Now, 1999, nobody could see this. I mean, even the BBC, I'm making this example not to criticize because it's very easy to criticize ex post, but just to say that, the, I mean, the common wisdom in 1999 was the internet was just another channel to distribute information. David Bowie keeping uh, Pac-Man Pac saying, no, it's not. It is an alien form. Okay? And, and you could see the presenter uh, making, making fun of David Bowie. Changes happens anyway. We have a double bang. We cannot escape it. Now let's be proud of our history. And as Winston Churchill was saying, if we don't take change by hand, it will take us by the throat. So it's our choice how we want to, uh, to, to, to deal with this. Now, so far it might even sound or feel that it's a little bit, let's say, daunting, scary, but the opportunity is huge. These are data from the world from, for the World Bank, the value created by digital technologies in the US, in the UK, in China, wherever it is our market, just the value created by, in terms of efficiency or in terms of new products, is in the, in the regions of trillions in the UK, in the US, in China, wherever it is our market. The opportunity is huge. And we want to take a slice of this opportunity. So how do we take a slice of this opportunity? Now, what I will show with you, uh, what I will discuss with you in the next few minutes is a, in a, an evolutionary approach towards a digital transformation. So many companies, uh, as I told you at the beginning, think that digital transformation is about adoption of technology. And some other companies feel that is about, uh, and look, in this graph, there is uh, on the uh, bottom data plus digital engines, then on the, uh, on the upper side, external changes. And, um, and, and then, I mean, in, in, in between, what are the typical uh, strategies that companies that go through digital transformation tend to, uh, to, to adopt? So the, the, at the very beginning, there's digitization per se, whereby companies start with marketing and sales, customer engagement, operations, work practice. But see, very much this, this strategy are based on data and digital engines. The only, the only feedback, the only input in the strategy is technology. Even when some companies move forward, they go in digital innovation, which is more evolutionary, still many companies don't consider the, the, cha the, the, the changes in the external environment. What happens on the contrary is that companies that really go through the full transformation, so they do adaptation, which is our goal, are ones that consider both the external changes and the internal ones. And to fully appreciate strategy in the digital age, I'll make the point here, and I will come back to this, that companies have to to grapple with this value creation and value capturing trade-off. Value from connecting the dots, so becoming a platform versus value from making the dots, remaining or being a manufacturer, okay? So there is a, a significant change from adapting, to, from adopting, apologies, to adapting to the digital age, okay? Now, very quickly, let me show you uh, some, some example. So this is the, the, the initial stage. And as I told you, adaptation is very much about uh, using digital technology for two things. 
uh, which is basically complement to what you already do and replace what you already do. Very much when companies that, companies that uh, go through digitization as adoption, what they do is, uh, this is my activity system, that's what I do. You use technology to complement, to even augment, or to replace what you do. But that's, that's okay, but it's very much as is. Now, digital technologies also enable not only to complement and to uh, replace, but also to do things differently, this third dimension of the axis. Companies that understand that you can also do things differently, okay, are the companies that start entering into digital innovation. So digital innovation means that you, and the activity that you were doing with uh, before is not just replaced or complemented, it's just done differently, okay? Completely different. For example, in the pharma industry, before pharma discovery was based on clinical trials, what does it mean to do it differently? For example, to use big data, okay? There's nothing to bear. <laughs> There's no legacy in big data and uh, artificial intelligence for drugs discovery. It's a different way of doing things. Now, this is something that requires a lot of uh, imagination, a lot of also capital, both intellectual and financial. But this is uh, what we call digital innovation. Then the next step is adaptation. Now, the, I'm going to start with a very famous quote. Nobody, I see, there is a lot of a hype that in the digital age, uh, things will disappear. Now, people, in the digital age, things will transform. It's not that we will not need banking. It's not that we will not need transportation. To make an example closer to, to many of the, uh, of the people on the other side of the screen. We will still need transportation. We will still need banking. But we, will we need banks? We will, need, will, will we need car manufacturer? I mean, it's today news that Tesla is worth a handful of the big car, traditional car manufacturers. Tesla, a loss-making company that produces relatively few cars vis-a-vis -vis the, the large manufacturer producing millions of cars, Tesla is worth three, four times, can buy most of them, okay? So the big question is not the science fiction, where the transportation will disappear, where the banking will disappear, where the entertainment will disappear. No, the question is, will we need car manufacture as we know them? Will, will we need banks as we know them? And this is the final point, and whereby, to, to understand what position we want to take here, we really need to think about. So do we want to, once we join this digital ecosystem, okay, do we want to create value by being a platform that connect the dots or do we want to make the dots? So let me give you some examples, okay? We all know Apple as a manufacturer of a sleek, stylish lifestyle, lifestyle handsets. Okay, now, once uh, Apple connect this, uh, this device, okay, with our heart, with our uh, lifestyle, Apple can become, can move beyond being a lifestyle sleek uh, pro producer of, uh, of uh, a handset to become health company the value of health of, of Tim Cook, what Tim Cook is pushing is becoming a health company. And I mean, this is not me making up stories. Eh? It's, it's Apple greatest contribution to mankind will be health, not producing stylish and desiderable handset. Or, and that's just to illustrate even more. So many people will, will make the dots. I mean, Apple will need the heart rate sensor. They will need the respiration rate sensor. So 
many of these, uh, many, maybe will be you doing uh, some of this uh, stuff, okay? But what value will you create? So you will make the dots. Apple will connect the dots and will tap into a market of trillions of dollars. So <laughs> there is no right or wrong. I'm just explaining the mechanism. You decide where, which, which game you want to play. But really it's about connecting versus making. And you can play also multiple strategy, but in, just to make it simple, <laughs> I have started in a very simple, uh, simple way. Or uh, we know John Deere as a, a producer of harvesters uh, or any other, um, let's say, ma machinery. John Deere is moving into farm forward. They are partnering with the UK Met office to do what? I mean, because people that are familiar with agriculture know that the big problem is the weather. So it doesn't matter that you have a fantastic harvester if you then you don't harvest at the right time. So if you manage also to get information on when to harvest and where to harvest, that has a massive impact on your productivity. So what is John Deere selling? I mean, of course it's selling this beautiful piece, piece of machinery and nobody's discussing it, but it's also selling a farm forward approach, whereby it's a full service given to the manufacturer, to, to, the, to the farmer. These things don't come easy, don't come cheap, and there are a lot of hiccups, eh? but I, I'm trying to explain what, means, what it means to connect the dots. Or when you connect the dots for companies on the other side that are more in the uh, luxury or uh, field. So many manufacture of creams or sun, sun uh, screens or uh, skin creams, they may be significantly disrupted by companies such as uh, Romy, where, whereby uh, this company is uh, by connecting our lifestyle so they, they collect information of what I have eaten today, how much I have worked today, uh, um, where, uh, what is the weather, whether it's uh, dry or, uh, or uh, uh, wet. And based on this, uh, they are able to identify your daily dosage for your skincare, okay? Now, I have worked at, with uh, several of these companies, of the legacy companies, I don't want to make names now, which are very, very worried that, that if, if this happens, the Lancome cream that you buy mostly because it makes you, I mean, also because it makes you feel good. If someone comes to the market and say, that's not a feel good cream, this is actually something that works for you today, that's a significant transformation. And I mean, more and more and more. This is a very interesting example. It's not really manufacturing, but allow me to do it because you will, you will love to take a space into this space, into this. This is ING, a famous bank. And I mean, you would not ever understand that, I mean, ING, this is a bank if you read this statement. So what ING wants to be is empowering people to stay a step ahead in life and business. So what is the ambition of ING? I have worked with the CEO of ING, so I know as a matter of fact what's going on here. So their ambition is to partner with the producers of locksmith, with producers of uh, um, with your, your, your gym, whatever. Not only, they will not only sell you a mortgage, a loan, they, their ambition is by knowing so much about us, they, their ambition is, so by connecting everything, is to put us uh, as a step ahead in life and in business. Okay, to put it in a, in a more graphical way, uh, a typical company that is pushing this connecting the dot strategy to the next level is Amazon, that is connecting a lot of dots. And here yeah, you see what are the, the dots that, that are connecting. And they are also trying to own many of them. Now we'll see when the regulator will get upset at what level, but assuming that the things keep going. So this is a typical representation of what we could call an ecosystem. So what would you like to do? Is it adoption? Is it evolution? Is it adaptation? Are you still resilient vis-a-vis -vis these changes. Now I'm going to make a very quick example. Think about you are John PLC producing this locksmith, okay? 
is not that I mean locksmith, uh, uh, locks, sorry, uh, not locksmith, apologies, uh, locks. So you produce, the, 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 you produce this lock. It's not that I mean locks will disappear, okay? You can still be an SME producing locks. I mean, the market will be that. I mean, we need to close our doors, okay? But when you start connecting your door, uh, your lock with shops, with uh, the police, uh, with insurance, with family, with the pets, with uh, our GP, with our delivery guy, with the cleaner, I mean, this becomes not any longer a lock, which look like, I mean, a relatively, uh, let's say, stable, low growth market. Once you connect it, this becomes something different, it becomes access to your, I mean, to a, a massive array of services. So you can keep, you can keep producing uh, your own uh, locks, or you can become, uh, by connecting, maybe you, you become the producer of, I mean, you're the ser uh, selling a service, the service of delivering to your house, of allowing cleaners to come to your house or letting the pet out when the pet has to go out for whatever reason. So, uh, see the example that I was making you before. Do, does the lock, John PLC, lock producer, still compete against other lock producers? The most interesting, interested company in locks is Amazon. You would, maybe you, you already know, but I mean, many people, for many people, this is a surprise. So why Amazon is interested in locks? And they have launched a key, even if it's still in an in experimental phase because they want to take it easy before the people react too much. Why? Because uh, they, once they, they control your lock, they control all these markets. So th the situation is changing rapidly. It's not that we will not need security for our, for our uh, door. We will, we will still need banking. We will need, need access to our house, to our homes. We will still need uh, transportation. But what's going to be the business? that will deliver on this need, okay? And that's really what it means, adaptation. Asking yourself the question, the way in which we create value in this changing world, in this change world, the way in which we capture value, which basically means what is special, unique about us. Is it resilient? Is it strong enough? Or the market has moved on, okay? Now, in all this, Technology, which has created this bang, bang can also be uh, of help, okay, of significant help. That's one of my latest uh, uh, research outcomes. I've been studying how technology can help significantly you in finding your own position in this uh, transformed world. So to, from moving from adoption to adaptation, and then what are the points here is that yeah, we all deal with data and AI. So that's the, the beginning of the two axis. But then the vertical axis is we, can, we shouldn't use data and AI for patterns discovery to reinvent uh, legacy value chain and overcome legacy trade-offs. We should use data and AI for automation and achieve personalization at scale. And in this funnel, what I show is the, um, the, the, what are the, the, the takeaway that I mean, we have discovered uh, from companies that have done it well, that they use technology to build a more resilient position in the digital world. So, uh, very quickly before I come to a conclusion, they build trust with stakeholders about the use of their data. They fuse AI capabilities and subject matter expertise. That's a big mistake that we see. Many companies think that they have to replace completely their engineers. By the way, I'm a mechanical engineer. My master is in mechanical engineering. So I, <laughs> I feel very touchy 
when, when they say, oh, it's all about computer science. No, I mean, people, they, they must know thermodynamics. I mean, you cannot reinvent the wheel. So it's about fusing AI capability with subject matter expertise. It's not about replacing. And of course, it is about leveraging the ecosystem to implement your strategy. Because if you learn how to manage the ecosystem, them to implement your strategy, you also de-risk significantly the way in which you, I mean, the, the risk and the, the risk, both market risk and financial risk, the way in which you deliver on your strategy, you implement your strategy. So I've taken perhaps a few more minutes than uh, I, have, I was kindly offered. The question for you is now, are you ready? And um, see, uh, if we were together in a, I mean, this, this meeting was supposed to happen face to face. So I wanted to keep, uh, to keep this, uh, uh, this slide, uh, not because it's almost lunchtime, uh, but because we see, okay, now we can celebrate the way we can celebrate together that we have gone through this presentation together. I mean, I hope I have given you some hints. Now, the point that I want to make you uh, uh, is that all of us, uh, all of us have been thinking that cakes are round. I mean, I particularly like with strawberries and chocolate. So we all have in our minds some frames about the way in which the world works, our business works. The point that I want to make now with you before saying goodbye is that the most difficult part of leading digital transformation and becoming resilient will be deframe our mindset. Deframe our mindset that cakes are round, that competition comes from John PLC, that clients want X, Y, Z, that uh, these, are a friend, these are enemies, these are friends. Deframing our own mindset will be a, perhaps the most difficult part to equip ourselves for the digital transformation and for resilience. Because if we keep thinking in the old way, we risk to be framed. And this, within this frame, we, don't, we, 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 will, we will miss the forest for the trees. So as we know, keep calm and reinvent yourself. The goal Unfortunately, it's not that we even lead the digital transformation. Digital is becoming very quickly transparent background. The world that we are facing is in constant transformation. So really it's about leading the transformation and long live the digital transformation, the digital revolution. So the point that I made with you today, now that I'm coming to the conclusion is that the digital transformation is about the technology, but is the technology is just the enabler it's more about the multi-level change. What should manufacturers do? I mean, we, you can start with digitization. Digitization will give you most efficiency. And it's very short-lived because it's very easy to copy you. That's the reason. Digital innovation will help you to, do, to move a little bit faster. So doing things differently, but really is about adaptation. So adaptation to the next, to the new environment. So which is what we call digital transformation. The question is, are you going to be a maker or a connector? Now, nothing is black and white. I mean, everything is about shades, but I mean, in these few minutes that I had, I wanted to make the points uh, like it was just a binary decision. It's never that binary. You can do multiple things, but at the extreme is making versus connecting. What should you do? That's exactly your, your strategy. And are you ready for this transformation? Thank you for your patience. And also for, I, I clearly went a little bit beyond my allocated time and um, now the uh, the stage is all yours thank you